Welcome back. Uh, so welcome back to the second part, the second half of this day. Thank you for those of you who are still with us. Thanks for all the people who showed up uh, now. We're new to this. Um, welcome to uh, Pixel 15. Um, I'm not going to hold you uh, very long. Um, I'm going to pass on to Franz Brandschutter, who's going to talk to us about his work on the Austrian uh, sci-fi movie Rubicon and about his part that he played in the production of the film. All right. Thank you. actually in a couple of different roles um, around. Sometimes I'm working as a VFX supervisor, sometimes as an artist, most of the time as a professor at the Film Academy, um, and I'm not looking like that. Um, so I have been, um, I had the pleasure, let's put it like that, I had the pleasure to work on a space movie in Austria, which is really rare, and I want to talk you through the process, how we actually made it happen. So, space movie in Austria. I don't know who has seen uh, the movie yet. It has not been in the cinemas for a long time, uh, a very short time, I would say. Um, but if you get the chance to watch it, I would highly recommend to do it. Visually, it's really. Um, amazing I think and after my talk you will maybe agree with me that it's really amazing what we have achieved with a very small team. Some people are here that have also worked on this project and yeah I will show you a trailer for those people who haven't seen it um, just to get you into the story a little bit and yeah what it's about so let's try it it works. Moving into ground control. Ground control, do you read? You did the right thing, Commander. We're safe here. Does anybody hear us? decided to wait a little bit. Um, I got approached by Leni Laubic, the director, almost two years or one and a half years before we went into actually shooting that whole thing. Um, firstly, she was a student um, at the Film Academy, so we knew each other. And secondly, she wanted to plan it really thoroughly. So her idea to create a VFX heavy movie in Austria was to plan ahead all of the shots because she already knew the budget might be kind of small. Um, and so we had to tackle a couple of challenges to get this whole thing done. And the first challenge that we had to, to tackle, and this is pretty much the same for every um, visual effects heavy project, it's to create the assets. And we are dealing with a very, very large asset here, a space station that was supposed to be based on the ISS. So a couple of our people went um, to the European Space Center to take a look how it's really looking. 
in reality um, to get a feel of it. And um, we quite early on knew that modeling a space station like this will probably take a very long time. And texturing <coughs> the whole thing, you know, to be photoreal in a, a cinema is just a huge challenge. Um, so, um, together with the production designer, um, we came up with a plan. Um, we had the plan actually to only model those parts that are really close to the camera in very high detail and also do the same with texturing and to basically try to, to limit what we had to, to model <coughs> in a, you know, um, in a production ready state. So what we did was actually to, you know, to, to divide the space station into areas. Um, and you, what you can see is actually a screenshot of the first, of the very first uh, design model. And like it always is, we had to basically delete that and start from scratch because it was done in a cut program and brought to Maya. And we decided quite early on we wanted to do something completely different. We wanted to work entirely in Houdini uh, to do that. And we wanted to go with a USD workflow, which was pretty risky back at the time because we also decided to render in Karma which was basically beta back then, and there was not a lot of support. So um, it was the kind of risk that I had to take because we knew Karma was able to render this kind of large um, models in a very efficient way, and we did not have the resources to, to do it differently. Um, we started actually from scratch when, when I began uh, in November uh, 2020, there were two people, and that was me and uh, a producer. So we had to build up a whole team, build up a pipeline, and we thought, well, why not just take the risk and do something completely new? Um, <clears throat> so this is a turntable of a very early version, and um, Lini was very very much involved in, a, uh, in this uh, process. And this is pretty rare, actually, I would say. And this was helping us quite a lot because we, we were able to communicate all the problems, all the issues right away. And she could actually tell us what is important for her. And you have that um, not that often that you know a director sits probably right next to you. Um, and, and gives you the information what she wants to see and what she wants to see in detail. Um, the modeling was actually done by Ari in Munich and um, I had the luck that I was working there as a visual effects supervisor five years ago or seven years ago, I don't remember, but a long time ago. So I knew the whole team there and I also knew the modeler um, who has worked with me on a lot of other shots or shows, so um, it was always kind of easy to, um, to tell them, hey guys, we need some more detail in this shot or in that shot. Because the main issue or the main task when you do a, uh, a space station like that and you are in pre-production basically or you don't really know how the shot is going to look like, you don't know what's going to be in camera. So how can you tell some 3D artists what to model and what, um, what will stay in the background? Um, so we had the three sectors that I showed you before and we also had the option to always go back to the modeling team um, to tell them, hey, look, we need more, we, we need more detail. We brought the whole <coughs> thing then into our USD uh, pipeline. <coughs> Um, and textured it and um, did, did first render. Mainly what we wanted to see and that's what you always need to try at first, is it rendering fast enough? 
and is it Flickr free? And that's, I think, for everyone who is doing 3D before, the main issues that we are always facing. It's a, a noisy render, it flickers, um, or it just renders forever. And this is something that we wanted to avoid. We tried to, to, push, um, to push down, basically, uh, the settings as low as we could get. Um, and yeah, we try to render in uh, different elements separately and things like that. So <clears throat> it worked amazingly quite well right out of the gate with Karma, which was not expected. Um, but yeah, we, we were happy with the station at that state. So um, for the space uh, ship, the Vesta, what it was called in the movie, um, we had Mason, a great modeler, who is actually um, here, um, who did um, who did actually um, model a very high detailed uh, spaceship um, based on some con concepts and also on a on a production model that we we could provide him. Um, and he also did the texturing for us, um, so that was um, really good. He did it in Rhino, as far as I remember, and then we, we brought it back to um, Houdini and brought everything into our pipeline. Um, yeah, it looked, again, it looked really great. Turn, small turntable here. Um, it was all about how is it going to work in the shots. Um, so. We knew we had a good basis, at least, and so we were confident. We did, I think, Mason, if I remember correctly, we did start in March, um, and yeah, um, I think one and a half months later, we basically had these two assets together. At the same time, we were trying to tackle the next challenge, and that's the, the Earth. The Earth was the main or one of the, the tasks that we actually never thought about is having an issue or a problem with. Um, because, you know, we know how Earth is looking like and there are a lot of models out there you can buy, there are presets, you can take, you can use pictures. But to have, you know, to have an Earth that is looking really convincing in each and every shot is a challenge. So we were trying to find the right approach. So all the renders you're seeing here, that's all renders we have done, test renders. Um, yeah, and so what we wanted to achieve was the highest flexibility. We wanted Lini, our director, to be able to change the world, the planet underneath the space station, um, in a way, what, however she liked, you know. So. When she said she wants to see Europe, we were able to do that and not render forever to do that. Um, it had to look realistic because we all know this. I mean, we see it in, in the news every day. Um, and yeah, and it had to be reusable. So it had also to render very fast. So our first approach was, yeah. That's easy. Everyone can do a, an Earth. Let's go all 3D. Um, yeah, that turned out to be very tricky. We did that. Uh, I have a couple of test renders here. Um, and they all looked kind of okay-ish. We are very close. Um, and they have detail, but they're not, they all do not look right. And since we were still in the process of animation, we also did not really know what we would see of the Earth in the end of each shot. So, um, yeah, we tried, we tried and tried and tried, and you know, render times went up when we added volumetric clouds to get this kind of nice long shadows, which you really want. Um, but in the end, we thought, is it really worth it? Is it? Is it the most important thing of the movie? Do we need to have like these volume clouds? No, we did not. We went all calm. 
So I came up with a setup in Nuke that allowed us basically to do exactly the same thing as our 3D guys would do. We had shadows that were actually following um, the sun direction. We could, we could simulate um, the sun going down. Um, and we did some test renders and we showed it to Lini and I think they look pretty good. So we decided to go that way. It gave us everything that we, we needed for the, for the movie. It was fast, it was flexible and it was cheap. And yeah, so that was actually um, the solution then for our second big challenge. The third challenge that we had were the toxic clouds. Two years when I, when I met Lini for the first time, she only talked about the toxic clouds actually. Because when you see the movie, this is what is the most important thing basically. Um, so, spoiler alert, the earth gets covered by a fog, clouds, whatever, the whole earth is going to be taken by something that we don't know what it is but it's covered by clouds. That's how she explained it to me. And, you know, that's the brief that I got, which is very helpful. Um, so, same concept. What is the right approach? Um, what do we want? Highest flexibility? Realistic? Mm. How can that be realistic? Uh, and reusable, because, of course, more shots and fast to render. Let's go all 3D. <laughs> um, yeah, so that came out after a couple of weeks of testing and it did not look correct. Um, it rendered quite a long time and it was based on volumes and it gave us basically this sausage-like cloud that were extremely noisy and they rendered a very long time. Um, I think almost five or six hours per frame and we could not afford to do that. Um, but we continued going that way because we were convinced that we can do it. Um, so we did iteration after iteration. Lini gave us feedback and I go back to this screen um, because um, a company that did the movie poster quite early on did this concept painting and so they were hooked with that and they said we need to recreate this um, or something like this but a bit different which is you know briefing wise always yeah not not the nicest thing to, to, to follow. Um, and we, we were, had really troubles to get this detail into our clouds because, you know, simulating a volume of that huge amount of, of density in a scale that is like the Earth is just impossible. So obviously we, we are not stupid, so we tried to scale the scene, we tried, um, we tried to break it up in parts, um, but still something did not look right. Um, so going all calm? No. Um, we decided to, to do a hybrid. We combined both worlds. We went with matte painting. We did a mixture of 3D and 2D matte painting where we used our 3D renders as a basis. We brought in a very talented matte painter who painted stuff on top and then we reprojected everything um, onto low res geometry. Um, and it started to look a little bit better. We were still not that happy, but we were then confident that we could do it at least. And this is, this is what you want to achieve as an artist and the confidelity that you know you are going to be able to do it and nothing else matters, you know. I mean, as long as you're happy with, your, with 
with the result. Everything else is a personal opinion from somebody else, but if you are happy, you can or you should be able to sell it. So we did a couple of different matte paintings um, and it started to progress and become better and better and better. We did, um, we did the whole planet in the end, um, even though it's not used in, uh, in the movie. Um, but just to give us the option to choose camera angles, this is like a 40K matte painting. Um, so very high resolution and it gave us the opportunity to recycle that um, planet in different shots. Yeah, and then you always have the last challenge and that's the same for everyone. And that's the shop production. And the first thing is to go on set and tell them what is not possible or what will be possible. So we had to deal with a couple of spacewalk scenes. Um, that's how we called it. Um, it was the, um, the part in the movie where the main actress is um, all suited up in her, um, uh, in her suit and she's, she's outside the station. So right from the beginning we told them, like I said before, our model is not ready for super high close-up shots and we're not going to do that. Um, so please build something for us that will work um, and whenever you place the camera try to be very conscious about where to place it and never cut it off in the foreground because we are not going to extend the foreground and that's what they built <laughs> and it's really small it's really super small. Um, so we got an emergency call uh, actually at the day of the shooting uh, from Lini, basically crying and begging us, can we um, extend it in the foreground because it's not going to work that uh, this will cover everything. Um, so we said no, it's not going to happen. Um, but Let's see how you shoot it. Um, you can see the measures um, actually there. And um, yeah, it was five meters and um, not even a meter uh, in height. So it did not even cover a body or something. Um, but we decided um, to use a mixture of blue screen and um, actually we shot most of it on black um, just to give us the option to let the model basically fade into darkness um, in the foreground. Um, yeah, it's not the ideal solution, but you know, given the budget and uh, the time, we thought we have to be just clever about it. And roto work is cheaper than doing like a high detailed uh, 3D model. Yeah, so um, I can show you how it, how it was planned, how the spacewalk was planned and how they did um, the rough cut or, or the rough cut that we got. It's not lining up perfectly, but it gives you an idea how, how we have or what we got from them. Huh? 
today. Life was okay. I'd be expecting twins, but it's normal. Jensen, what's going on? Kevin, can you hear that? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> you, you can see Leaning is sticked pretty well to her storyboard. And the rough cut, it looked scary um, because there were quite a lot of shots actually that we did not really expect. There were so many. Um, but it seemed to be somehow doable. And um, I walk you through <clears throat> one of them. Uh, I think it was the, the first one. Um, where we, for the first time, we can see her outside. So, um, yeah, we got this plate, and you have seen at the beginning, this was actually one of the plates where we decided to, to go all black at the beginning to hide, um, to hide the, um, the connection. And, yeah, compositing stuff, like removing um, a rig where she's hanging, and we did quite a lot of tests before that, how to make her float. Um, and um, it seemed to be the, the easiest and the cheapest solution to fix it in comp. And yeah, a blue screen that was, yeah, somehow okay. Um, yeah, it's never fine, it's never perfect. Uh, so yeah, we did a lot of rotoscoping here obviously. And uh, after match moving this, so we went in and did, and did a match move, and our 3D animation department, or artist, uh, Aaron did put in, who's also here, uh, did put in um, the space station, and um, did a couple of versions, just trying to art direct how station is going to look in this in the shot and it was and this was the fun thing because we actually had the freedom to do whatever we wanted to and to place the station however we thought it's going to to look good so um, here's the final comp um, without the final movie grading but um, yeah it looks kind of Kind of nice, I think. Um, so we had, as you can see, very clean renders and very fast render times. Um, we could render a shot in six hours and with um, with full resolution, so 3K, and um, it worked really well. Now the next thing, or the the other, we had a lot of them, and it was, you know, we only had the storyboards or the what what Lini called the animatics, 
and that was basically a storyboard um, telling us or trying to show us what what we should do in this shot. So yeah, we started early on with this process, but it turned out to be very important to Lini. And yeah, it was the first time ever that I experienced that, but Lini actually was sitting next to the animation artist, Darren, sorry for that. Uh, she was sitting there every day and walking through the shots with you. Um, she had a lot of fun. <laughs> and we, at the beginning, said no to this, but she insisted. She actually called me one day and said, where is he living? I'm sitting next to him in his, in his living room. I don't care. I want to sit there and be hands-on. So, um, yeah. That was, the, that was actually what Aaron got as a brief. And, um, yeah, it was not a lot. I mean, we got the idea, yeah. The Vester is actually detaching from the station and then flying down the earth. Um, but you have a thousand different ways of doing that, obviously. Um, yeah, so we did what normally we would do previous visualization and previous, um, but since production was already done, you could call it post this or we called it layout. So we did like a rough animation and then we refined it and refined it until Lini was happy and Aaron could move on to the next shot. Um, so <clears throat> I think that was one of the first versions. And you also can see that we have a low res uh, geometry in, our, in, in Maya. So animation was done in Maya um, and, and then exported to, uh, to Houdini. Um, <clears throat> now, this was actually the final version, so it did a couple of iterations, not too many, um, to be honest, because Lini was sitting there and we could say, hey, you say how you like it, and then it, that's it. Um, so that was basically the final. Uh, animation and um, yeah, from there we went to, um, to lighting rendering. You can see uh, layering issues. Um, <clears throat> and what else you can see here is that we always had an um, earth in our render scene as well. Um, it was not really meant to be used in production, but it was very important for us to get like color um, contribution, uh, like a a blue cast in our in our renders, um, and also to have a sense of how it should look like in comp, because you know we were doing the earth in comp. Um, yeah, so um, a first a first look um, version three, and that never gets approved. Um, so also in um, in compositing on these full CG shots, it was uh, very tricky to get. Um, to get the look correct or to get what Lini wanted. So we did a couple of iterations and sometimes we even did some concept paintings on a still frame of the shot to get her to tell the, or basically to give her options to choose what she wants to see because I mean you have nothing, you have a blank slate and you don't really know what she wants to see. Does she want it in sunlight? Does she want a sundown or whatever uh, she wants we can do but you know we have to give her options. Um, so yeah, we we went completely different with the look. We turned on the um, the lights, rotated the earth to the dark side basically, um, and changed the light setup on our station as well. And yeah, and in the end, um, she wanted um, more of water, more. Sky, more city lights. We have an internal version that is a bit different um, with a lot more clouds because we always found that our compositing earth was looking a lot better with clouds on top. Um, but that was a, yeah, 
these are the compromises you have to take. Um, Leni wanted the earth in all or in most shots without clouds because then there are the toxic clouds later on in the movie and you know you don't want to see the earth covered in clouds all the time. Um, yeah. So yeah, the secret to make this happen in Austria, in budget, in time, <laughs> which was um, really rare, but just great artists. I mean, we had a, a great team, a very small team, to be honest. Um, trust in the process. We did try a lot of things and we failed miserably. I showed you that and I think you have never seen uh, a talk where people show you what did not work. <laughs> um, but you have to trust in the artists. Everyone wanted this to be really great. And so everyone worked quite a lot to get this done. We dared to find easier solutions, which is also something a lot of companies do not want to do. They, they stick to their plan. And if it's not working, they try harder. But sometimes harder is not better. Sometimes you need to investigate what is the best solution. And the easier is sometimes better. And I mean, we also had people that are, were only consulting us on some, on some shots. We, we, we reached out to a lot of people. I would never say I know everything, so I called friends. And we had, yeah, difficult talks. We had, um, we had talks where we said, yeah, it just look, does not look good. We have, to, we have to change the way we approach it. And we had to communicate a lot. And that was, I think, the key, or one of the key thing, the key factors that this worked out, that we were in touch with the director and with the production right from the beginning, and we, you know, could talk about everything, very, very um, honest, and that's and that's very important. We could tell them what will work and what will not work, and we could also tell them, hey. This is not gonna happen because you cannot pay that. And <clears throat> since they were all very scared, because uh, a science fiction movie in Austria was never done before, and um, when they saw our first shot, they were like, they said, "Okay, guys, no, we will approve everything because it's looking really great." And so we had a lot of fun, and I think that was the. <laughs> the key ingredient to it. Um, we had a small team, so uh, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Um, I think I counted it, we were around 17 people um, working on that project. Uh, and that's not a lot actually to finish almost 100 shots in six months. And I'm really glad that some are here. Some of my friends who helped um, were actually doing me a favor and um, a lot of artists that worked for us did us a favor because um, we had not a huge budget. Um, but the visual quality that came out of that project um, speaks for itself and there is no shot that you cannot take on a showreel. Um, so I will show you the visual effects work that we did.
All right, thank you very much. Thank you also for staying in time. Um, <laughs> first of all, that. Um, that means we have time for our Q&A um, with hopefully a lot of questions from the audience. Um, is there anyone who wants to go first? I think there's... Oh, oh thank you, Brian. So a, a, a danger that it comes with producing such a quality in a short time with the budget is that they come back to you and expect you to do it again. <laughs> Are you worried about that at all? No. Um, we told them right away that this is not going to happen again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but did they listen? Um, and, I mean, <laughs> at least until now, <laughs> they listened, yeah. Um, I mean, I think that we have to also be very, very clear that um, sometimes a small team is actually able or capable of doing a lot more than people expect. And it helped us quite a lot to not have a huge overhead and also I mean, we did it like students. We had no pipeline. We hadn't, I mean, we built a small one that worked, um, but we had, basically we did, everyone did his or her shot like they wanted. I only cared about quality and that it looks right. And I think you could, if, I mean, most of the visual effects companies that I've worked for, they're very, they're very strict in their hierarchy. They're very, um, you know, top down. Um, there are a lot of decisions, you know, not made because somebody else is in charge. And this, when you don't have a lot of money, this is not good. And I, I knew that. I, I, I had a, a company a couple of years ago in Munich and it is still very successful. And we, we knew that we cannot be the same as everyone else. And I told Chris from Arx Anima that I'm only doing it my way, otherwise I would not have accepted this, this uh, film. And I know we had a couple of people that did not fit into the team because they were used to work in the you know, large company structure and they were waiting for daily reviews and you know, a producer telling them what to do. And we did not have that. I told them, there is your shot, there are your renders, make it great. And that's how it worked. And I mean, for an Austrian movie, I think if you set up the visual effects company in a very sleek way, you can create great stuff with not too much money. Yeah. How long did it take to create the um, satellite station, the space station? Was it the, the time invested? The, Who the did model? it? No, the modeling and texturing. How many, how many days? What? How many days? For how many days? Oh, <laughs> it was a long process. Lini, it was pretty much the same as with um, Aaron's animation thing. Lini wanted to basically sit next to the guys, um, modeling and, and texturing the stuff. But um, Ari had a very limited budget as well, and they told her this is not going to happen. Um, we model it, you say what you want to choose, and you can uh, do this four times, and then it's done. Um, so, and we did the same with a couple of shots where we had problems. We, we communicated quite early on. We have only a limited amount of money for each shot and time. So you've got to see it three, four times and that's it. And um, the modeling started in January and it was, everything was done in April. So four months, yeah. one artist. When you first saw the storyboard of the 
animatic, what are like the thought processes of how you would go about building the shots? Or what goes to run through one's mind? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, first of all, you are scared because you think you are not able to do it in time. Um, that's, I mean, that's, uh, as a supervisor, and that's the, the difficult part, I am creative at the one hand and also I have to look at the money and at the, um, you know, at the hours as well. Um, and I think we did not do a lot of overtime, which was also very rare, um, and that was really important for me as well. Um, I mean, I knew that we could do it. Um, we, when we had a good base, we had a good asset, and we brought in one of the best animators, so what could go wrong anyways? And um, since Lini insisted on being there, um, actually we did not have to think so much about getting it done. It was more these live action shots in combination with the CG shots, um, <clears throat> or with the CG. Um, the, the spacewalk things, they are always, or they can become very tricky because, you know, people can have opinions on how the station is going to be attached to the live action thing. Um, but, like I said before, they, we, what, my, my idea was, I will blow them away with one or two shots and then they will eat me out of my hand anyways. And, that's, and that worked. Um, it really worked. Um, they never actually wanted to change much. They they trusted in the creative process, and yeah, so it it was okay <laughs> to see the storyboard in the end. I think we have time for one more question. What was one of the biggest risks you took while working on that project? Um, <clears throat> um, well, one of the biggest things was, was the decision to change the toxic cloud setup from 3D to, um, to DMP, to matte painting. Um, first of all, we did not know if they would like it. And, you know, it's a complete change of concept because the I mean, we had a combination, it was 3D and 2D, um, but still you're not that flexible anymore. Um, you're, I mean, if you have a DMP, a, a matte painting, you are stuck to a certain angle at some point. And if they would not have liked it, we would, would have to go back and find another solution or redo the whole matte painting. That was, that, that will, Kept us, um, kept us struggling, and, and also, um, yeah, um, we were, you know, or we doubted a little bit if that decision was was good or not, but um, yeah, um, it turned out when when they when they liked it or when they, they liked what they saw, the all the toxic cloud shots, they were just super easy to do, because. You know, it was basically a compositing shot with a little bit of 3D reprojection, and they were done within days. Yeah, so, but we didn't know that. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. Thank you so much for what I believe is an amazing project. We really enjoyed your talk. Um, thanks again. <laughs>